MSD, I work um, near Philadelphia uh, at um, the North Wales site uh, in a group that does high throughput screening. And um, what that means uh, is, is basically we have a lot of robots, a lot of cool toys, and we run a lot of biological assays. And I'm going to go into one use case of machine learning. Uh, I'm not going to try to cover everything that is done within MSD. Uh, I'll just tell you one thing that I was involved in. Um, and so to motivate this talk, let me give you uh, an overview, uh, in part because this type of um, uh, field might not be what, what some of you are used to thinking about. So it's um, first I'll motivate the technology, and in this case the technology is a biological technology. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you about the problem. So basically we're measuring gene expression in order to try to understand the effects of compounds on cells and to understand disease states. And so we're doing this by uh, treating tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of samples with different compounds and looking at the gene expression that's elicited by these treatments. And what we see is that um, you know, we'd like all of our data to be clean and perfect and reproducible, and that's not always the case. And so we have to contend with noise. And so what this story is going to be about is how we use machine learning to overcome some of the noise in this biological data. In particular, we use a metric learning approach to try to clean up the data. But then we found that by looking inside the model that was learned, looking at the internal representation, we can actually capture a good bit of biology uh, and chemistry. And I'll um, uh, uh, give you some examples of, of what this model can, uh, can do. So um, to set the stage, what we're basically trying to do is we're, we're trying to understand, to take the pulse of this cell, right? So we're, 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 we're trying to understand what's going on in a cell in a disease state or in the case uh, where, where we're treating with a drug or a drug candidate, try to understand how it's reacting. Um, and so um, bringing you back to uh, uh, perhaps uh, far, further back than you'd like to remember, uh, the, the, the central dogma of biology where all of our cells have the same DNA in them and what makes a skin cell different from a liver cell is what genes are expressed in, in that cell. So the way that genes are expressed is RNA is made, and then that RNA is translated into protein, which then gives structure and function to, to your body. And so if you want to take the pulse of the cell, you might think that the best thing to do is to measure the, the proteins, because that's the business end. Um, but unfortunately, there isn't yet a good way to cheaply, reliably, comprehensively uh, measure all the proteins in, in, in a sample. And so we take one step back and look at the RNA as a proxy. Um, and for this, there have been technologies developed since the 90s that allow you to do, to uh, measure all the RNAs uh, in a sample um, pretty reliably and pretty cheaply. And so this affymetrics technology, uh, again, is uh, 15 years plus old, 20 years old. Uh, and, and allows you to, to look at the, the expression state of all the genes in the human genome. So what has changed more recently is that this process has gotten miniaturized and industrialized. And so now, instead of um, looking at um, hundreds of samples in a year, we can look at hundreds of thousands. And so the first step to miniaturize this is to realize that you don't need to measure all the genes. So we have 20,000 genes in our genome, but they're not all unique snowflakes. They actually uh, um, follow certain kinds of rules. And so in this example heat map, which I hope you can see, green represents upregulated genes, uh, red represent downregulated. Um, and so the, the columns are genes and the rows are samples. And the thing to take away from this uh, is that, you know, you can see large blocks of color. This is clustered, obviously. You, s you see large blocks of color, which indicate that there are similarities. So a, a bunch of different genes are all upregulated across all these samples and then downregulated here. And this is because genes are co-regulated. They're regulated in, in similar fashion. And so um, you can extract the essence uh, of this information by taking representative genes. Okay, and so you can reduce the 20,000 genes in the genome to about 1,000 representatives that give you all the information that's, that's in, in the genome. So, you know, you guys must be familiar with other dimensionality reduction techniques, uh, SVD, CUR, and so on and so forth, so similar approach. 
Um, but this quantitative reduction in, um, in the number of genes that you measure leads to a qualitative effect on, on the sample throughput. So now we can reduce this from a centimeter squared array to a platform where we can have 384 samples in, in a plate about the size of a, a deck of cards. Um, and we can use robotics to move uh, samples back and forth, and we can increase our throughput by at least 100-fold. Um, and so this is technology developed at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, and that's being commercialized by a company called Genometry that we're working with. So what does this data look like? I'm, I'm going to show you what it looks like before I, should, before I tell you what we use it for. So this is a sample, one, one experiment, about 7,500 samples that's been projected to two dimensions using T-SNE, a dimensionality reduction approach. And here, the axes don't mean anything. What's important is, is the proximity of points. And so two points that are close together have similar gene expression profiles. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're treating cells with a bunch of different compounds. And these compounds come from different classes, from different projects. So the compounds in yellow are from an antiviral program, and the compounds in red are from an anti-inflammatory program. And some of the other colors, black is third most populous. Uh, are sort of from a d diversity set. And so you can see that the first thing is that the colors segregate, right? You can see yellow separating from red and, and largely from, from black. And this is because when you have compounds that have different effects on the cell, they elicit different gene expression responses, and so the cell uh, behaves differently, and it looks different when you take its pulse using these 1,000 genes. So um, why would we want to do this? In, on such a large scale, as, as, as opposed to sort of on a smaller scale the way it's been done for 20 years. Uh, there are three use cases. There are more, but I'm going to uh, uh, show you three. So one of them is mode of action determination. So what if we have a compound, a drug candidate, or even a drug, which we know has an effect on the cell, on a disease model, on an organism, but we don't know how that effect is, is mediated. We don't know what its target is. Well, we can get its gene expression profile, and um, then we can, oops, then we can compare it to a large bank of these gene expression profiles and see if there is another profile in our database that is similar. So if, if we find something that's similar in the database, we can look up what that compound is, what that target is, and then we can infer the target of our unknown. Very similar approach is looking for a potential safety problems, right? It's, it's exactly the same process. Here, you take your compound profile, and then instead of comparing it to a database of profiles of um, 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 activities that are desirable, you compare it to a, a, a database of undesirable profiles of toxic compounds. And then if you have a match, then that tells you that there's a problem you have to look out for. And then finally, repurposing. So this is using uh, compounds for, um, or drugs, for uh, um, applications for diseases other than the ones for which they were first developed. And so if you have, for example, a, a disease state here that, that you know a compound is effective for, then you can see if there are other disease states, perhaps an orphan disease, something that doesn't have a big population, that doesn't have uh, drug discovery dedicated to it, but if there's a match in the gene expression between the two disease states, that would suggest that this, perhaps this compound can be uh, used for, for this novel uh, indication. Alternatively, instead of looking for correlation, you can look for anti-correlation. So if you have a, an orphan disease, for example, for which you want to find a drug, you can look at your drug profiles and find profiles which are sort of the mirror image. So if these genes are upregulated in the disease, you want them to be downregulated by the drug. If these genes are downregulated, you want them to be upregulated. And so this suggests that this drug might reverse the gene signature, because the disease signature, and thus the disease process, because it has an inverse signature. So those are sort of th three ways in which uh, this type of gene expression data can be and is used. So what's the problem? The problem is that there's noise in the system, and, and the noise is sort of a collaborative effort of biology and technology. Um, biology is squishy and d is not necessarily reproducible. We do these experiments by treating cells in culture. N cells 
feel different on different days. They wake up on different sides of the bed. And, and in addition to that, there are many steps in the biological technology in the readout of these genes and error propagates through them. And so there are, the upshot of this is that when you do the same treatment on two different days, you get different results. They're correlated, but they're different. And when you try to do the types of analyses that I showed you on, on, on the previous slide, the guilt by association type approaches where you're trying to find a similar gene expression profile to infer similar function, well, if you can't get the same result on two different days, then that, that makes it more difficult to transfer knowledge between compounds. And so what I'm showing here is that if you take a compound and, and, and you rank by similarity all, all of the other profiles in an experiment, in this case 7,500 profiles, and ask where in that ranked list from most similar to least similar a biolog its biological duplicate is. This is its twin, the same treatment done on a different day. On average, it's 225th in, in the list. So that means that there are 223 samples which are more like your treatment than something that is actually the same treatment. So this is what we're up against. And the solution, we finally get to the machine learning, um, the solution that ended up working the best for us is a metric learning approach. And so the goal here is to learn a new metric on the data. So I showed you that by using utility and distance or correlation, we couldn't get a good match between, uh, between things that should be the same. And so we taught this algorithm to learn that things that were treated the same way are the same and things that were treated differently were different. So, so that's the, the, the learning problem, just predict whether two samples are replicates. And so it starts off pretty simply for those of you familiar with neural networks. It starts off as a simple feed forward neural network. You feed in your samples. I said there were about 1,000 genes that we're measuring. It's actually 978. Uh, and you feed them into the network. They go through a couple of hidden layers with uh, noisy sigmoid nonlinearities. So the, goal here of the noise, we add noise before applying the nonlinearity. The goal here is being to favor saturated units, either very off or very on. And then we get to this uh, 100 roughly binary, 100-dimensional um, hidden layer. And then, then things um, are somewhat different from, from the classic architectures. This is effectively a Siamese architecture where we split adjacent samples and we calculate a distance between them. So this is how we're, we're learning a metric by, by calculating the distance between adjacent samples. And then we combine that distance with the target. Is this a pair of replicates or not a pair of replicates? And we calculate a cost, we back propagate that cost, and we learn the parameters of the network. So that's fine. It works pretty well. If you test it on a held out test set, it, it's 97% accurate in terms of determining what's replicate and what's not. But this isn't that interesting. It's, it's, um, we, are, we did the experiment, so we know what the replicates are. Um, but the payoff is that if you crack open this model and look at its internal representation, you can actually get an, a rep. So you know, this model learned to do a better job of differentiating replicates from not. So how, how does it do that? Well, if you look in, inside, you can actually take this uh, hidden, the activations of this hidden layer. Um, they're almost binary, but you can make them binary by thresholding them. And so now you have a 100-bit vector that represents uh, the information in, in this 1,000-dimensional continuous sample. And what I'm going to try to convince you of in the following slides is that this does an actually better job than the original data of not only representing what's replicate and what's not, but giving you information about the target of the compound, the compound structure, as well as activity across other assays and uh, specificity versus promiscuity. So to start off with, this is the uh, training objective, basically, to make replicates more like each other. Um, and so um, I, I showed you that in the raw data, your replicates are approximately 225, um, or your, your uh, yeah, your replicate is approximately 225th in the list, and the barcode data is 24th. So that's good, but that's what the, the, the model was trained to do. Um, what's more interesting is what else it does. So here 
if you treat two, um, if, 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 if you have two compounds that have the same target, you'd expect them to be closer together. They would have a, a more similar effect on the cell because they hit the same target, so they should have a, a more similar expression profile than compounds which, are, which hit a different target. So that's your expectation. If you look in the raw data, you can barely see that. So if, if you look at, at the difference in the distance between two compounds that don't share a target versus two compounds that share a target, and look at the T statistic, it's minus one. So that sort of trends in the right direction, but it's not significant. In the barcode data, it's minus 43. So the, the samples that share a target are much closer together in, in the barcode space. Um, if you look at, uh, so you can structure compound, you can cluster compounds by structure. So you can see that these compounds sort of have a similar structure to each other, and these compounds sort of have a similar structure to each other. This is often done in chemistry and chemoinformatics. You can also cluster, obviously, these gene expression profiles using hierarchical cluster k means. You'd expect that compounds that look the same sort of fit into the same places and into the same holes in, in in, in the cell and so have, an, uh, have a similar effect. That would be ex your expectation that's barely borne out in the raw data, but there's much more of an overlap of the clusterings by compound structure and by, um, by gene expression in the barcode space. Speeding up a little um, and putting all this data into one table, I've told you about the first three lines on this table. The fourth one is we can compare other bioassays, so measuring a thousand genes is one bioassay, but we run a lot of other assays on these cells, and you'd expect that the effects of cells um, in, in the, the effects of these compounds on cells or on biological processes would correlate, and they do better in the barcode space than they do in the original space. And finally, what was a little bit surprising um, is that you can actually predict large-scale uh, properties of, of the cells better with the barcode data. So if you build a, a predictive model, a support vector regression model, that tries to predict how promiscuous compounds are. So here you can have compounds that are very specific, they only hit one target as indicated by the red dot here, or you can have compounds that are very promiscuous, hit lots of targets. You can do a better job of predicting selectivity versus promiscuity uh, with this barcode data than you can in the original data space. And now the barcode data, remember, was gen generated only from this expression data. And it's reduced from thousand dimension continuous to hundred dimensional binary. So you lose a lot of information, but yet you're still able to uh, capture this sort of high level uh, uh, properties of, uh, that, that are inherent in the gene expression data. And so finally, all this has been retrospective validation can we do prospective validation? Can we actually predict something and then show that it's true? Uh, in fact, we can. I hope you can see. So this is a T-SNE plot like I showed you in, uh, at the beginning of the talk where uh, we have lots of treatments. You can zoom in on that map to a certain spot where we know what some of the compounds do. We know that these compounds labeled in orange affect a certain target, MAP kinase. And we can ask, are the compounds in the neighborhood, or the treatments in the neighborhood of these knowns, do they have the same biology? You'd predict that they would also affect the same target. Do they? Well, in the raw data space, uh, there are not that many in the neighborhood, and so we found two. We tested them prospectively in an assay for MAP kinase, and we found that they're indeed active. In the barcode data, we captured those same two, but we captured four additional ones plus two false positives, so it's no free lunch, but we, uh, we are getting more um, um, samples that are implicated um, in, or which are de-orphaned in the sense that we are, we're finding their targets by using the barcode data. And so uh, that's basically it. Um, we are, have used metric learning to um, improve the reliability of the data that we're getting from these large-scale gene expression experiments by using the internal representation of the metric learning model. We've denoised the data, or alternatively, we've extracted latent factors, and we've increased the ability to, to uh, pull out uh, things related to underlying chemistry and biology. And obviously, there's the potential to apply this sort of approach to other areas where um, data isn't perfect, and there might be some noise. And so with that, uh, I just want to
thank the organizers again and uh, acknowledge my uh, collaborators as well as uh, Genometry and uh, make a shout out for open source software. MSD doesn't build machine learning toolkits. We uh, take advantage of those that are available uh, in the ecosystem. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we have time for a couple of questions. Oh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have one question. Uh, if I understand correctly, your method for measuring the mRNA is qualitative and not quantitative. Uh, quantitative. Is that right? It, it, it is quantitative, it is. So you're able, uh, so you're able to distinguish uh, what's the difference between the expression? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, some, some of the people here are uh, somehow processing, classifying, or correlating not single events but sequences of events. So for example, like the speech recognition guys, you know, there is not one word but the word of sequence and we want to decode it all. Yeah. Uh, are there examples of, of some sequential uh, classification also in your domain, for example, some like, temporal evolution of like, drug effects on some cell, or am I completely off? Uh, no, no, you're not completely off there. There is a, a lot of uh, kind of domain modeling that you can look at in, in terms of pharmacokinetics and, and things of that nature, exactly, measuring drug levels and drug responses. Uh, and then in, in biology in general, looking, you know, Using, um, looking at, at the DNA strand as sort of temporal um, uh, component, you can march along it, and, and there are lots of successes using hidden Markov models and whatever. So, so yes, there are there are definitely uses for for, for sequence data. One of my interests is, is, is trying to apply it to um, to, for example, chemical structures, which can also be thought of in some ways. In the sequence, so, yeah. <coughs> data with gene ontology because in the cells you can have uh, the major pathway with a major protein so are you planning to combine it because by distinguishing major uh, proteins in the pathway you can distinguish maybe you can distinguish replicates more reliably if you're going to use it yes so we, we we did we did benchmark that that approach so 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 basically uh, the idea is, is, is not to look at single genes, but to combine genes that, that have a similar effect, and maybe uh, noise in, in one gene would cancel out and, and, and things would reinforce. And that does better than the raw data, but not as well as, as the metric line. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, last year, uh, the company Merck hosted a competition on cable for something similar. It was for a drug reception study. And uh, uh, the, the algorithm that won the competition was some uh, deep learning framework uh, using uh, restricted Goldstein machine and so on. And apparently it is uh, implemented already by Merck. So can you uh, please add uh, some details of the algorithm that you use? Yeah, so the, the the specific um, application was uh, to predicting function from chemical structure, so, so it wasn't looking at, at trying to decomplete the behavior of the cell, it's trying to start directly from chemical structure, what kind of predicting the structure in terms of what, what, what the activity of, of this molecule will be. Uh, and the, the big success from that model um, uh, which was just a, 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 a deep feed forward net, actually, it wasn't a, a, a restricted Boltzmann machine, but that, that showed a significant improvement in um, multitask learning. So, so for a given, if, if, if you give it a single data set at a time, it doesn't do much better than the state of the art in our, in our, in our in house state of the art at the time, um, but you benefit from giving it many different data sets at once, and it sort of learns to transfer information between them. And, and, and so that was the, the, 
they pay off of, of the, the details in, in that case. And, and that has been borne out after post guard yeah. uh, are, you, are you able to see any biological correlates with the uh, barcode representation? Some, uh, are you treating the barcode representation yeah. just as a black box representation, which is not interpretable, or are you seeing something which relates to known biological either aspects or right? Um, right now, we are treating it as as a black box because um, because we haven't found anything interpretable in it. I mean, we're 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 not using only this, we're not using this in isolation, we're using this in addition to the, the, the sort of approaches I mentioned before based on grouping genes, based on function. And so this is part of, uh, of the analysis, but in terms of, of trying to figure out what each of those bits means, uh, I, I haven't figured it out yet. At least. Thank you. Uh, you described how you use these uh, tests or analysis for existing materials, for existing chemicals, compounds. Uh, do you think it would be viable to use for theoretical compounds, for example, uh, the model molecules, and then uh, predict how they will interact with in the body? Uh, so, this this model is based on on having the molecule in hand, so you can treat cells with it and get a, a, a gene profile. But the model that was mentioned before, the one that 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 the, co the category competition is based on, which starts just from chemical structure that you can use theoretical uh, molecules from, because they're anything you can imagine, you can put to the model and, and, and ask it to predict how it works. So, so that's basically how those models, they're called QSAR quantitative structure activity relationships. That's how those models are often used, is, is, is you then score virtual libraries and, and uh, use that scoring to suggest what molecule the chemistry should be. Uh, hello. Uh, did you also yeah, oh. uh, did you also try to learn the barcode representation not from the reduced set of 1,000 features but directly from the 20,000 genes? Um, no, we have. So that there is less data. I mean, the nice thing about this platform is that that, that we have a data set now of <coughs> close to 100,000 samples, which we don't have. In a uniform sense, genome-wide. However, in the databases, there are lots of one-off experiments. People do experiments three or six samples at a time and, and deposit them. And, and, and so you could think about aggregating all those public domain experiments that are genome-wide and do, do this sort of approach. Where the noise is even greater because there's lab-to-lab -lab variability and time and all that. But um, um, it's it's not a bad idea. It's just Uh, hello, I wonder, uh, is it uh, important for this kind of analysis also to know the structure of the compounds that are used and what, what methods do you, uh, if so, uh, what methods do you use to, uh, to, to uh, resolve this uh, structure, if it's crystallography or NMR or some, some other methods? Um, so the, the structure of, of the molecules is, is known because it, they're made internally by chemists and they, they, they're designed to be certain molecules and they're verified that, that they got the molecule that they observed. Do we need structural information for this analysis? No, we don't, but you can combine the structural models along with the, the phenotype-based models and, and get increased reliability in terms of predicting the function. Uh, probably predicting adverse events too, even though we haven't felt that. I have one philosophical question. Supposing there is a drug uh, that can enhance the human body without any side effects, okay. would it be possible to find this drug using machine learning or some kind of computational optimization? Um, it would be possible if uh, the problem with that is that you're, uh, 
uh, the optimization criteria isn't very clear, but if, if, if you could specify uh, uh, very clearly what you wanted, you could use the types of approaches mentioned here, as well as, as the structure-based models, to come up with a list of candidates that then you'd have to test. So, so this is not, it's, it's never going to get you all the way to, to an effective drug. It's just going to help you look in the right place. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.